everyone. I'm Donna Fiducia. And I'm Don Newen. And this is Cowboy Logic Radio. Cowboys didn't dance, didn't wear designer shirts. When their hearts were filled with memories, their bodies filled with hurt. They would sit around the campfire and exchange a piercing glare. Welcome to Cowboy Logic Radio. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Cowboy Logic Radio. I'm Don Newen. And let me be the first to welcome you to tonight's riveting episode. Boy, have we got a massively large, ginormous show for you. Back to you, Donna. Toga, 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 toga. That's all I have to say about this whole Kavanaugh thing. You must be thing. talking about Animal House, Donna. <laughs> yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. Because, you know, back in the 80s, they questioned Kavanaugh because he threw ice at somebody at a bar or that somewhere. so bad. And, it is and so bad. That he obviously is a party animal. He's a real ice hole. <laughs> He's an ISIS. <laughs> well, you know the left, they're trying to abolish ice. Maybe that's why, because somebody alleges that Brett Kavanaugh threw ice at a bar one night. It's just ridiculous. There are two things to keep in mind here. First, the FBI cannot indict anyone. They can just investigate. And number two, none of the so-called accusers have filed charges with Montgomery County Police in Maryland. No charges filed. And they've said we have no charges filed, so nothing is there to investigate. But tomorrow there might be some charges filed, Somebody especially will make if Michael Avenatti, the, yep. the slip-and-fall porn lawyer, has come up with something. The creepy porn lawyer. Misdemeanors. I hope he runs for president. Is, I do, too. Uh, and Jeff Flake. We'll get to that in a minute. Yeah. Misdemeanors is what the Montgomery County Police said what it would be. Misdemeanor? Anyhow, No. No, it's misdemeanors because we're talking about her last here. name's demeanor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what, what is she alleging? No. Come it's, on. What is misdemeanor? It's mis- a misdemeanor Ale- since oh, it's 36 in years a, ago. I got you. Even though the statute of limitations isn't completely right. off, apparently, mm-hmm. but they will investigate any complaint filed. Do we hear any complaints? Crickets. Mm. Crickets. No. None. Okay. So The Hill is reporting that Kavanaugh texted a friend about Ramirez's charges at Yale before the New Yorker reported it. (gasps) You think maybe it's because he really did it and he knew and he was nervous. No, it's because he got wind of it and he wanted to find out what was going on. Oh, my God, how stupid are these reporters? The left will never quit. They want some 24 witnesses question now. They're just coming out of the woodwork. They are vowing to dog Kavanaugh if he's confirmed. How ridiculous. You know, the lefty Lucy's, as in Charlie Brown's Lucy, keep moving the football on poor Charlie Brown. On NBC, creepy porn lawyer's client, Julie Swetnick, said that she saw Kavanaugh buy a punch bowl at a party. And that punch bowl was spiked. And Kavanaugh was by that punch bowl. Anyhow, they said to her, can you name the four people you say were there? Well, the first has denied it. The second is deceased. And the other two, well, again, crickets. Crickets. Hey, can I interject something here? <sighs> Why just one more thing. I don't this want to listen to one This woman, more thing. Swetnick, said these were rape parties. There were ten of them. So she went to him 10 times? What was she looking for? And not to mention her ex-boyfriend, who apparently dated her for seven years, was on Laura Ingram yesterday, and he said she's a lunatic, too. She has no credibility. Yeah, she doesn't. Okay. Look, here's the big problem with all of this. Mm -hmm. It's all moot if we don't keep control of the House and the Senate. Ladies and gentlemen, you see the stuff that's going on right now. If we lose the House of Representatives or if we lose the Senate in, in the elections and during the elections in November, you take what's going on right now and you ramp it up about 2,000%. You have no idea. 
we have no idea about how bad it will get if if the Democrats end up controlling the House or the Senate. This is going to be child's play, Donna. I am dead-ass serious here. If we lose that House, and you've got people like Maxine Waters that are that are heading up committees. They're, yeah, they're going to be heading committees. They will. I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, we have to get out and vote. You have to get everybody that you know out and vote. And they got to vote red. Yeah. Because I'm telling you. We have no this, country if they don't. You, you will not recognize America if they take over the House or the Senate. I'm, it's, it's, I can't say it enough, Donna. No. And we're trying. In fact, when I met um, Brian Kemp's wife, Marty, last week here in town, she had a little get together. She's making a campaign appearance. What a lovely woman. What a lovely family. And she said, you know, a lot of the problems are these young kids. A lot of the ones on the left who are activists in college that have no idea what a real job is like, they'll come out and vote. Unfortunately, a lot of the young kids are not. So we have to try to motivate these kids because well, this is their future, and we're leaving them really in trouble. There's the just no left doubt about it. is seriously energized. Mm-hmm. They are energized more than the, than the right has ever been, and they've got one thing: they smell the scent of blood. Yeah, and they are absolutely rabid. There is so much money that's being dumped into the left, and some of these bogus five hundred one c four organizations. That it's it's insane. It is, and Kemp, uh, Mrs. Kemp, actually said Stacey Abrams has about two and a half times as much money of as Brian does. Kemp does. If you can just send even five to ten bucks to the candidates in your state, it's a huge help. You don't have to send anything to them as long as you get out and vote. Well, if you can get out and vote and take ten people with you, yeah. motivate ten. Voting people. costs no money. Yeah, that's true. That's Creating true. lies and distorting the truth takes a hell of a lot of money, and that's exactly what they're doing. I mean, you don't think there's a lot of money behind Dr. Ford? Yeah. There's a massive amount of money. Absolutely. This pro bono BS that her lawyers are feeding. Yeah, and then she goes and raises $900,000 on a GoFundMe which account. Is sickening. Where's that money going? Absolutely sickening, because our yeah. friend Kathleen Willie, somebody set up a GoFundMe account, and how much did she end up getting? She's not even at a little over $12,000, and she's about to lose her house. That's pathetic. She's 72 years old. She has been devastated by the Clintons, let alone the fact that her husband died mysteriously. I'm sorry. It was not. A suicide, but that's just my personal opinion. The thing is, he is one of the Clintons' dozens of casualties, and ever since then, for like the last thirty years, she's well, that right been toxic. There ought to put this into perfect perspective for you. You've got Kathleen Willey, who has been all over the news, attended one of the presidential debates. Donald Trump sets her down with the other Clinton accusers, with, yeah, well, and the victims Broderick. of the Clintons, yeah, and and she scrapes her way to twelve thousand dollars on a GoFundMe uh, account, and then Dr. Ford's got 900000 In one day. That right there tells you that the left is on steroids. They and are. you got to vote. <laughs> you got to vote. They are on steroids, but also the fact is, when Barack Obama was president, he set up a lot of government-funded uh, entities, unfortunately. Uh, The Consumer Finance Protection Board was one of them. And a lot of it is he was able to funnel taxpayer money, you know, basically launder it for the left. And and that's just not happening on the right because the right plays by the rules. The left doesn't care if they cheat. You know who else has come out of the woodwork? This guy just needs to shut up and go away. James Comey, he called for unlimited time. Just shut up. I'm sorry. My prediction is the left who typically hate police, the FBI and the CIA, any authority for that matter, until the Mueller investigation, of course. But watch out. If the FBI doesn't come back with findings they don't like, they will turn on them in a nanosecond. And boy, I can't wait for that to happen. I just can't. I wish I was a mind reader, though. Do you ever think of that? A mind reader, with the exception of uh, Cory Booker, whom we know assaulted, maybe worse, uh, a woman when he was 15, he wrote about it. But I bet this is what every senator questioning Kavanaugh is thinking. Hmm, man, I'm glad I don't get answered these questions. Because <laughs> you notice, you know, they have a slush fund. Still, of course they a do. taxpayer slush fund. It's actually a hush fund. They still won't tell us who has utilized it, 
to this day, and they still have not stopped it. They said, oh, yeah, we stopped it. No, they Haven't didn't. Haven't they used like 17 million? Yeah, millions. Yeah, on top of this other 20 million that Mueller spent. Big picture, we are a banana republic. If you're guilty until proven innocent, we are doomed. The left hates the Constitution, but given the attacks on a duly elected president with the Mueller investigation, remember, we still have that investigation going on. If this prevails with Kavanaugh, nobody is safe in this country, and we have mob rule. It really is a hashtag double standard. Isn't it amazing, Donna, all these things, all these issues, all these events, all these unbelievable things that the left wing bring up and then they last for about two or three days and they disappear Move like to the next, Omarosa yeah. and, and all this other stuff they bring it up and then it disappears yeah where's Stormy Daniels been lately Avenatti's got a new client yeah he's he's two time in Stormy Daniels and her big round enormous massive bulbous pupils <laughs> Had me scared for a minute. I almost thought I might have to hit the dump button. (laughs) Hashtag double standard. Keith Ellison, on the other hand, remember, he is the deputy of the the DNC, the department. Listen to me. The Democrat National Committee. And he's running for attorney general in Minnesota. Now, he was accused by his girlfriend just recently of physical and verbal abuse. With photos. With photos. She has corroboration from her doctor as well. But the DNC did their own investigation, so hey, they're going to be didn't, unbiased. Didn't she file a police report as well? I believe she did. Mm. But guess what the DNC concluded yesterday? Oh, I think you told me that they didn't. Ha- she didn't have a video, so it yes. wouldn't stand up. Her allegations not are credible. not true because there is no videotape. Are you serious? How the thing is the chutzpah. I, I just love Yiddish words; they're the best. The chutzpah, the nerve. I like the Yiddish words when you're talking about a Muslim ball. <laughs> That's great, Donna. <laughs> the unmitigated balls that they have to say this woman has no videotape, so therefore her allegations are not credible. So what do we have here? If you're a privileged white conservative like Kavanaugh, or the Duke lacrosse players for that matter. Or me. Yeah, or you. You have no rights. Well, no, you went to University of Tennessee. You're not a privilege. <laughs> no <laughs> rights. And you are Did guilty. Did you hear that, everybody? <laughs> She went to Seton Hall. You didn't go to let Harvard. Me, let me tell you. You didn't go to Yale. Let me tell you what happens prep- at Seton Hall. Oh, you did Hall. go to a preppy school. Let me tell you what. Let me tell you what goes on at Seton Hall. Donna. What, what goes on? A football doesn't. I'll tell you Powder that. Powder puff football. <laughs> they have the little flags that hang off their gym shorts. <laughs> but if you're a their Democrat, stadium, no, that's Rutgers. Rutgers Stadium <laughs> looks like a middle school football field <laughs> in Georgia. It's embarrassing, Donna. For the Donna. Northeast, was, that's listen, a pretty good football stadium. I was stadium. embarrassed for anybody that went to Rutgers. Your ex included. You should be, you should be embarrassed, embarrassed for, for University of Tennessee is what you should be embarrassed hey, for this year. It does not matter <laughs> what the record is. All that matters is how kick-ass your stadium is. Well, they have like 100,000 people they can I fit think, in that stadium? I think right now it's between, it's between Tennessee and Michigan. I think Tennessee... Their football stadium, Nayland Stadium, holds 1.9 million people. I expect like Ben Hur to come out, you know, out of there with the with the <laughs> no, the that chariots. would be Spartacus. Spartacus, yeah, that's right. <laughs> the aforementioned oh, here comes Corey, Corey Booker. Booker. <laughs> what <laughs> a schmuck! Is it possible to be a black schmuck? He's a schmuck with chutzpah. <laughs> That's what he is. He's a. He's got the guillons. He, he abuses and molests and gropes women at age fifteen, and admits it and writes about it but in the school a newspaper. Democrat, so it's okay. And he gets up there and he questions Kavanaugh. What chutzpah? I'm sorry. So Karen, you talking Monahan, about calling the judge black? <laughs> Karen Monahan is Keith Corey Ellison's Booker. accuser, and she's out on Twitter asking for anyone, anyone to tell her side of the story. I don't Who know is? why Fox I, I missed that. Her name is Karen. Uh, I don't know. I just threw my piece of paper down. But but what what's her significance? Keith, Keith Ellison's accuser. Oh, yeah. okay. So let's well, review. Well, let me tell you why everybody's so afraid of that. What? Honor killings. Yeah, really. That would be because Keith Ellison is. <clears throat> Not 
Christian. Let's just put it that way. And Christians, by the way, white Christians are being attacked. That's really what the bottom line is. White Christians and Christians in general, because Herman Cain was Christian, are being attacked. Donna, let me ask you a question before you go into your next piece of paper there. Is there anything that is recognizable to you that is left wing that you would recognize and identify with the American values that our country has? No, and and I was thinking about that because even when we were in college, I'm a little older than you, but when we were in college, people said the same thing they said in the 60s. I might disagree with you, but I will defend your right to say it. Now that's not the case. This is classic Marxism, socialism, communism. You either, either say what we want or we nudge you, and you still don't say what we want, we push you. You still don't say and do what we want you to do, we force you. And then we shut you down if we can't get you to behave the way we want you to behave. This is communism. Hey, let me just say something. Venezuela, Cuba, when Castro... South Africa. South Africa. And when Castro took over... North Korea. When when they all took over... Russia. China, Mao Zedong. Six million Chinese were killed. Mao Zedong? Yeah, Mao Zedong. Well, that's how you say it. D-U-N-G? Yeah. Well, it's a proper way to say it. Who flung dung? (laughs) Stop. The thing is, all those people, when they came to power, the useful idiots below them all thought, oh, this isn't going to happen. He's going to help us, and we're going to get everything free stuff from the government. We're going to have a great standard of living. Well, just look at Venezuela, because that's the latest one to fall. And when it falls, it falls fast. And you know what? I say to this day, if Hillary Clinton got elected, we'd be on the way to be in Venezuela big time. There's no doubt in my mind because you have too many useful idiots now coming up through the college system that have no idea what it's like to have a real job, which is my next topic. Did you have something you wanted to say? Yeah, I do. Um, You know, Donna, when you were talking about uh, some of these communist leaders, it made me think of of a book that I read the other day, uh, Poop on the Ceiling by... Who flung dung? Stop. You know, my mom had my mom. Your mom had a had, sick had sense the, of humor. Yeah, but you know what? It's funny. She had some great antlers in the tree. Yeah, tops no, don't go through by who all goose of them. the moose. Yeah, but you can't go through some of them. They're not suitable for G rated audiences. Tiger's Revenge by Claude yeah. something. How about um You make them with your spaghetti. Yeah. Balls. Yeah. My balls. That's true. Trails yeah. in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> by something dragon <laughs> will you stop he's got a sister named jane <laughs> all i know peter is fonda people okay? don't know who what books are anymore no let no. alone poetry right. and titles ebooks funny ebook titles yeah that that would be what under the bleachers be. by seymour butts okay. yeah all right <laughs> it's about the only one your mother had that was g race to the toilet by ip willie Daly. make it <laughs> willie make it. edited by betty don't <laughs> did she really say that yeah oh, gosh that's hilarious that's pretty funny all right parents you want to know why junior can't get a job and is playing video games in your basement while you're trying to figure out how to pay their three hundred thousand dollar college debt? the russian lover by i ripper no don't say that i won't well off george <laughs> This because every silly. Russian's name ends in off. Yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> in Georgetown University, believe it or not, there is actually a professor. Her name is C. Christine Fair. And she tweeted over the weekend, quote, Entitled white men should Me. have their corpses castrated and fed to pigs. Now, this woman, C. Christine Fair, is anything but... She's an associate professor in Georgetown's security studies. Well, that's where you want to earn a living. What'd you major in? Oh, I majored in security studies. Where are you getting a job? I don't know. So the program, the security studies, um, that she apparently is an associate professor. And this is, by the way, reported in the Daily Caller. But that wasn't enough. She went on to tweet, tweet number two. Look at the chorus of entitled white men justifying a serial rapist arrogated entitlement. Is that such a word? Arrogated well, entitlement? She's referring to Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh as a serial rapist. I, I'd like to know 
why Where we is have the guilty evidence for that? and why we're guilty until proven innocent again. So she linked the video of Lindsey Graham defending Kavanaugh and then said, quote, all of them deserve miserable deaths while feminists laugh as they take their last gasps. And then the bonus is, quote, we castrate their corpses and feed them to swine. Yes! Exclamation well, stop point. Stop right there, First Donna. of all, that's a threat well, on a city senator. Of course it's a threat. And, and there have been plenty of threats made by the left. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, we are illustrating to you exactly why your vote and your vote for a member of the Republican Party is imperative in November. You don't even have to like the Republican that you need to vote for. We can handle dealing with with one bad elected official. We cannot handle, we cannot handle losing the House or the Senate. Here's what really scares me. Let, let me add one, one more thing, Donna, and I'm sorry. we got two minutes left. Here's something else that Denise Simon and I talked about in this week's sit rep. And this is the definition of a fascist. Jerry Brown, through... <laughs> some type of a governor executive order, whatever he did. Oh, I heard about this. Just mandated <laughs> that every public and private company must have a woman on their board of directors. It doesn't matter if she's qualified or he's qualified for that matter. It has to be at least one woman. So therefore, you're going to have inferior people because you got to make sure you fit what the... The state of California, which is so in the tank and in the red right now, has no idea what it's like to run a business, is re- is mandating. So what is that? That's giant sucking sound of more people leaving California. What? At what point do, do, does the left, with, a, with bizarre affirmative action crap like that, at what point is it, is it just going to be public knowledge that it's fascism? Well, this is the feminazis that Rush Limbaugh talked about decades ago. He calls them feminazis. You want to talk about fascism, too. This idiot professor at Georgetown, first of all, Georgetown actually uh, defended her right of free speech. Yeah. In 2018, she was stopped and detained for calling German officers Nazi police at an airport in Frankfurt, Germany. God. Look. You know, you as know, long as we're going to tolerate this, this kind of crap's going to happen. And if Donna, you have we sons, go to break. who do we have yeah. coming up? We if got you, a great show, ladies and gentlemen. We do. And if you have sons, you got to be worried about what's coming up because this is just nuts. All right, coming up, we'll be talking to Elena Maria Lopez. She's actually a Democrat. She's going to be talking though about immigration fraud and false allegation awareness month kind of topical, I'd say. Curtis Ellis, also who worked on the Trump transition team, will be talking with us. He also is now working as a senior policy advisor with the America First Policies PAC. And also we'll be talking to Dr. James E. Mitchell talking about enhanced interrogation and how witnesses can actually believe they're telling the truth when they're not. It's all coming up next on Cowboy Logic Radio. Back to Cowboy Logic Radio. I'm Donna Fiducia, along with Don Newen. And our very special guest this half hour is a woman, a fellow Jerseyan, by the name of Elena Maria Lopez. And Elena Maria Lopez has a, a phenomenal story to tell, albeit very tragic. She's a victim of immigration fraud. She's turned into a whistleblower and a citizen advocate. But she's also a domestic violence victim. She has testified before the Senate. She's presented a series of security immigration fraud cases to the Trump White House. And uh, she's a victim, really, of foreign spouses using uh, immigration loopholes 
to bypass background checks and um, uh, proper vetting procedures, really, and hide criminal activities. High-ranking members of Congress seek her expertise. We're also finding so many of these immigration lawyers, many are in the D.C. swamp, are frauds. They rip off people trying to become citizens. And on the other hand, Elena Maria Lopez also is talking about September as being False Allegation Awareness Month. So, Elena Maria Lopez, welcome to Cowboy Logic Radio. You actually are coming from both sides of the aisle, really, because you're open-minded, and that's why, I, I, I mean, in our phone conversations leading up to this interview, we just hit it off so well, because although you're a Democrat, and I'm a Republican now, we're both from Jersey, and we're open-minded, and Don has his hand up already. Can she at least say hello? <laughs> sure. Okay. Hello, Absolutely. thanks for having me on. <laughs> Elena. Let me be the first to welcome you to Cowboy Logic Radio. Thank you very much, Don. It's a pleasure to be here. Now, many times when we have at least bilingual guests. Oh, no, you're going there. Okay, go ahead. I impress both the listening audience, our beloved listeners, as well as our guests with my international speaking skills. Do you speak German or Dutch? Because that's the only way you're going to impress me, Don. Sorry. Yeah, Fräulein, yeah. <laughs> okay, so here we go. I'm, it, and we're going to make this very brief. This it's is a, serious it's, stuff I know we're it talking is. about here. And that's exactly okay. why I'm doing what I'm doing. All right. I'm bringing in some lighthearted stuff, and then we are going to smack our beloved listeners in the ear hole with some serious stuff. Okay. Okay, so here you go. Now, Elena. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my best to enunciate this properly so that I don't screw this up. But I do want to tell you, or I want to say to you, how you doing? <laughs> That's almost good. That's awesome. How you doing? What's up? Yo. What's I'm up? doing okay. You doing okay? <laughs> you doing okay? I'm good. I'm good. Turnpike Parkway. I got Which people that know people, or don't mess with me. I know people in low places, right? See, exactly. Hey, now, I got I a vowel at the end you, of my name. Watch I out. I guarantee you that you profiled me, and you thought <laughs> that I was going to speak Spanish to you. Absolutely. When in, when I'm in fact, sorry. When in I'm fact, sorry. I spoke New Jersey. I know. I'm sorry to have made that judgment. <laughs> See, that's profiling. You Democrats, I tell you what, you're all the same. Okay, all right, now that's profiling. Let's let's get some let's get down to some serious stuff because, quite frankly, I don't care what side of the aisle anybody's on. When you get into the discussion of domestic abuse, when you get in the discussion of of trying to determine whether an allegation is true or false, when you've got some people that are falsely accused. That's a big serious thing, and and this should be something that does not see any political side. And and ladies and gentlemen, we've all seen what's been going on in the past few weeks, past few years, with with regard to the Me Too movement, with allegations that are being uh, you know pressed uh, pressed against individuals. When you've got some people that you you seem to think are walking away from the obvious scot-free, un- unaccountable, and you've got other people that are being, their careers and their lives are being ruined. This is a very serious subject. So, Elena, let's start by having you tell your story, because you are a domestic violence victim. I am, and I'm a domestic violence victim put in hiding by the state of New Jersey, because the state of New Jersey considers my case to be so serious that my safety is still compromised. I was responsible for my Dutch husband's or former, you know, husband's green card. And as soon as his green card seemed guaranteed, the missions literally just started rolling out of his mouth. Um, I only married you for a green card. Hurry up and sign these divorce papers. Um, And by the way, keep signing all the rest of my immigration paperwork. I refused. And that's when he became violent. And everything happened so abruptly. I wondered if I really knew who he was. I also started noticing strange financial transactions as well, like as the lease on my car had changed. He was applying for credit in my name. Um, all of these things were all happening at once. And I'm going, whoa. So I started contacting people that knew him in Holland. And I found out I knew almost nothing about this guy. Despite meeting him through a friend, thinking I had properly vetted him, waited the proper amount of time, you know, to get married, um, all of those things. And I found out he was involved in extensive criminal activities in Holland. 
he should have never been allowed into the country, um, but bypassed the background check because he was marrying me. He was marrying a U.S. citizen. And uh, I found out he lied on his visa to get into the country. He lied on his green card paperwork. Um, you know, I can just keep going on, and I was just horrified. But here's the one thing that I asked for. I never asked for anyone to just take my word for it or believe me. I asked both my local police and the Department of Homeland Security to investigate based on what I found. And I think that's where the failure is within the system. And it hurts both sides. It hurts people like me who are, who are the true victims. And it helps people when they're falsely accused of allegations. If there's no investigations, you can't really solve the situation. And somebody might end up with a tarnished reputation or people like me might end up actually and still in fear for their life all this time later. The Duke lacrosse players come to mind. They went to high school in New Jersey with my kids, actually. They were a couple of years older. They're, they had siblings that were in the same grade as my kids. My kids knew them very well. The families were totally, totally wiped out financially, emotionally. Their reputations for these kids were totally tarnished. And that, again, is something where it seems like you're guilty until proven innocent. In your case, you came forward, you wanted to talk about it, and they didn't want to listen. That's what's so disconcerting. The authorities didn't want to listen. Oh, absolutely. We lived in rural Pennsylvania at the time, outside Philadelphia, and when my husband at the time said she's just upset because we're getting a divorce, they just believed him and left the house. And I was horrified. Um, a week later, as I was packing my belongings during the middle of the day, he came home and uh, threatened me with a firearm, you know? So I've never been able to get them to even investigate um, to actually believe me. And it, he was still threatening me despite having to flee my own home because I was responsible for his immigration status. And he was afraid that he'd be deported if they found out the extensive criminal activities that he was involved in. Elena, were you able, during this horrific period in your life, were you able to document any of this on, say, a video or an audio recorder? A lot of, here's the hard part. You don't think you're going to be walking around your own house with a video recorder all the time. So a lot of the stuff I was catching at the tail end. But yes, I did go into documenting things at the tail end. Um, and, I mean, everything from he admitted it to other people. Um, I, but that's hearsay. Um, I was able to document every single one of the criminal activities. Um, the, it's hard about the abuse. The only way to document that the abuse happens is if you really get a full investigation from an impartial body. Well, and there's also many different kinds of abuse. For example, right. for example, let's say that you've got a, uh, a man and a wife. The, the man is not necessarily slapping or physically abusing the wife. He's not necessarily um, verbally abusing her, but he doesn't let her sleep at night. He'll wake her up over and over and over again. And he's doing this intentionally. Now, that to me is is maybe a form of domestic violence that's not necessarily talked about very much. But quite frankly, our good friend Dr. James Mitchell, who developed the enhanced interrogation program used against high-value detainees, that was one of those techniques. The sleep deprivation. Right. Right. Yeah. And so I think it's important for the listeners to understand and for us also to bring up the fact that domestic violence doesn't end with a fist, a foot, a mouth. It doesn't end there. It can go into areas that you really might not think about. But when you start depriving someone of sleep, obviously, that's serious yeah. stuff. And, I, and, and, I, and, I, and I'm not bringing that up to lessen the severity of anything you possibly would have gone through or anybody else for that matter. I'm simply stating this is a bigger, broader problem than we're watching on TV right now talking about Kavanaugh or, or any of these other things, mm. Keith Ellison or, or the, you know, uh, what's his name from Minnesota? Uh, yeah, uh, that, uh, yeah, that is Keith Ellison. Yeah, I was yeah, going to say that's yeah. Keith Ellison. Yeah. And I think that's hard to quantify because... I mean, if you read the Keith Ellison case, I mean, a lot of it was emotional abuse. Does it really qualify? And that's a gray area that... Um, Does it qualify as what? 
is is domestic violence and some people would say yes and some people would say no it would base be based on um you know are you living with a narcissist is that considered abuse that's the regular buzzword now that people are using i'm kind of on the fence with that um because i think that there absolutely is emotional abuse but is somebody really holding a gun to your head or something like that saying you must put up with this and that's the fine line where i it gets really muddy really quickly because people are claiming emotional abuse and is it really just a bad relationship? Is it a fight between two people? Um, you know, should people not be together in unhealthy circumstances? That's really difficult to quantify. And the, not only do I have problems with this, courts obviously do. Sure. How, how, what's your take on this hashtag me too movement? Cause to me, again, it's guilty until proven innocent. And that's not, uh, you know, what our constitution calls for. I agree, but what our constitution also doesn't call for was um, people like Nicole Brown Simpson having to make nine phone calls to the police and them refusing to do anything every single time. Yep. Or even the culprit, corporate, and that's even before she ended up dying, okay? And even on the ninth time, they still let O'Day Simpson flee the scene of the co- crime in his own car, even though they were... Uh, going to detain him. I mean, I think that's problematic. And I think a lot of men and women have really gotten fed up with this or the corporate culture that it's okay to smack, you know, the lady on the butt and say, if you really want to move up in your culture, this is or in the, in the corporation, we're going to act like mad men um, stars, you know? Um, I don't think that's acceptable either, but I, I don't think we really know how to handle these allegations yet because we're not having these unbiased investigations which can really help protect people on both sides either the alleged abused or the alleged abusers and i would think both sides would want solid investigations absolutely couldn't agree with you more i think there's two things that need to be discussed with regard to um eventually getting to the point where these investigations can be handled with integrity and with fairness number one is the amount of time that that lapses between the alleged incident and bringing it to light. I think there should be some type of a determination, and quite frankly, maybe it's a, a, just a logical answer that you would have here. You know... Statute of limitations bring, yeah, comes statute to mind. Statute of limitations on when someone can actually bring an allegation forward. Now, granted, there are, there are probably rare exceptions where an individual suppresses things so deep within themselves that it takes years and years and years to even get it out. But right. I think that's probably a rarity, that it Not would be always. that severe. That's Not what always. I wanted now, to ask you. The other thing is this. The other thing is this that needs to be taken into consideration. Loser pays. Now, that should if be you're everywhere. you end up having an allegation brought against somebody, and you know because you know this is your area, one of your areas of expertise a scorned individual male or female can ruin another individual's life and there's absolutely no validity to their claim and absolutely. so you know if 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 they're going to demand the investigation if the investigation leads into some type of a trial setting or a judgmental setting that that can potentially um reveal a a victorious individual in that in that claim loser pays yeah if it's frivolous to me besides wine that's the one thing the french got right loser pays <laughs> you know but uh, elena what but i wanted to ask you is what are your thoughts on that oh, okay. those are two I, real I important agree. points i think mm-hmm. i i actually agree and um because i've seen cases where fraud has been clearly stated um fraud of the fal- false allegations being malicious and i think that should be loser play pay Hey, excuse me. And um, Donna, in terms of what you said about um, the Duke incident and all the parents, I, I agree. These things can really clean people out. It cleaned me out. When I didn't have anybody willing to investigate, I had to hire my own attorneys. I had to hire a retired FBI agent to help me document everything. I was trying to take him to court, not to be malicious, because he was still threatening me. He was still threatening my life if I spoke to authorities, and I needed somebody protect, to protect me. But the only way I could get somebody to protect me was if they investigated. So I absolutely agree with you that mm-hmm. losers should pay. Let me ask you this. They, they are saying in this case with Blasey Ford 
that you can't say where it was, when it was, not even what year it was, even though she remembers how old she was. So I guess we could do the math on that one. Um, If you're that traumatized, most people that I've talked to that are victims of domestic violence know exactly when it was. And in many cases, numerous times. And and they'll remember particulars. Do you feel that um, she has a, a legitimate argument, even though she's got no particulars here? I think she has particulars on the incident, but maybe not the exact date or, you know, stuff like that. Um, I think, yeah, that is legitimate. I have met um, child abduction victims that actually didn't remember what happened until years later. I mean, it took them between the ages of 8 to 19. They just kind of thought they went off with somebody and they didn't understand what happened. And they almost had to piece it back together because it was so traumatic for them. Um, For me, like they say with people that suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder, you can either remember every little detail all the way down to the smells in the room, or you could kind of block certain things out. Part of what I was also doing in my own case, the reason why I remember specific dates, like I remember a lot of things, but sometimes I can't remember the because so much happened within a short period of time. I actually had to go back and check my emails because I started emailing myself just to put a time stamp on everything. Yeah, but there's, there's something real important that you just said, and that is that so many things happened in a short period of time. Mm-hmm. This is one thing that happened one time based on what we're hearing the other big problem i'm having with this and and i want to make things clear anybody that makes an allegation like this their story should be heard their story should be heard what goes on now especially in the in the kavanaugh situation the keith ellison situation is it's and 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 all of the things that have been going on within you know, Congress, right? Quite frankly, and and the fact that these these members of Congress are are basically let off and paid for with tax dollars to defend themselves. Yeah, the, to, the slush to, fund that the congressmen yeah, are using to pay on, off let's, women. Let's not get into that. I yet, know is that you know there is everything it appears of late is being turned political, and that you know when you look at at a group of, say, let's just take 50 people to use a round number. And half of them are saying, I believe this woman. Nobody's ever heard her speak about it, first of all. I believe this woman. And the other half of them are going, well, we need to have, you know, uh, be able to sit down and talk with them. And you can split it right down the line. If you've got a D behind your name and you're sitting in Congress or the Senate, all of a sudden you believe this woman. And if you've got an R, right? Uh, yeah. Well, this is, and I'll tell you, this is one of the reasons it turned me off from the Democrat Party, and that's Hillary Clinton, Elena, because for her to sit there and call them bimbo eruptions and inta- attack Juanita Broderick and Kathleen Willey and all the uh, the women that did come forward uh, against Bill Clinton, and now she comes out and says, "Well, I think you know that Blasey Ford, you know, should be heard and everything." She's just, just go away. You know, that that woman needs to shut up and, and go away. But that's another story. Talk a little bit, bit about, if you can, you testified before the Senate about your experiences. You also presented a series of uh, security immigration fraud cases to the Trump White House. Has anything uh, come of that? Are they working on these things to try to stop this immigration fraud? Because it is a huge problem. Oh, it is a huge problem. It is a huge problem. Um I testified before the Senate um, about my immigration fraud case, but I also, and by the way, to do that, once again, I didn't say trust me. I had to go through six weeks of evidence vetting. I had to submit all of the evidence that the FBI agent and I submitted to the Department of Homeland Security, okay? I had attorneys from both the Democrats and Republicans grilling me, and because they're an oversight committee, they are able to pull immigration files to see whether I'm legitimate, my evidence is legitimate, and whether my case is legitimate. So once again, it goes down to investigation. I never asked anybody to take my word for this. Um, Sadly, nothing has happened since then. The Department of Homeland Security, even though we were able to document about five clear grounds for uh, deportation and for my safety, um, they have done nothing to investigate or possibly deport this guy. So I'm kind of left in limbo and still living in hiding. And he but, was European, and so he probably had some sort of uh, 
uh, sort of paperwork. What really scares me is these immigrants coming through Mexico. Many of them are Syrian refugees or coming from other countries that are war torn at this point, And they have no paperwork. They can falsify anything they want. And that's right. becoming a huge problem. Yeah, but it turns out um, they don't do the proper vetting because if we had done the proper vetting, he would have never been allowed in the country. And mm-hmm. all of the paperwork was linked to my marriage and my sponsorship. Um, so even though I tried to withdraw it all, they didn't care. Um, but because I'm a former journalist and when you're having a mental breakdown, what do you do? You research stuff to death. Um, I started collecting cases because I started tripping over other cases. I live in New Jersey. We're a high immigration state. I found a Cuban-American, it's not even a race issue, I found a Cuban-American that sponsored an Egyptian, and he was still married in Egypt. He was just trying to marry her, get a green card, divorce her on paper, and then bring in his whole family over. And I started seeing cases like that time and time again, and I started collecting them. And that's how I literally tripped over all the national security cases. And those involve false allegations. So that's how we tie false allegations back. So... All yeah. Right. All right. Well, we got we got about four minutes left. Let me ask you this: How long did that investigation and vetting process take the, for your situation when you testified in front of Congress? It took me six weeks. Okay. For them to vet for to vet evidence and All right. interview me. Now let's think about this, and I'm going back to the fact that they this this uh, Doctor Ford woman, I believe, has been completely politicized. By your party of choice. By Absolutely. Her lawyer. Now, hold on Big a second, time. Donna. Look, you just said that it took six weeks to properly investigate your your findings and your claim. Mm-hmm. Why didn't uh, Diane Feinstein bring this up in July so that six weeks later we're not in the middle of the midterms? I even asked Senator Grassley. I sent his staff personal emails, because I still deal with them all, begging him on the download to start an investigation with the FBI to get this rolling immediately. Yep. Yeah, but the bottom line is, it took your six weeks. I find it very strange that this this came to light about 45 days, or for all my really far-left progressive friends, six weeks before the midterms. Well, and also, sound, did, I mean, doesn't it sound a little suspicious, a little politically suspicious? But Feinstein also met with Kavanaugh for hours, never brought it up. And of course, this comes out the day after or the day or two before the confirmation vote was supposed to happen. It's just I, I hate them all. I really it's I just ab- really want yeah. to drain the swamp. I, I'll be honest. It's with you. absolutely politically expedient for these for Democrats to bring this up now, but it's also politically expedient for Republicans to deny due process down the road. So company like organizations like SAVE have found out that one in 10 uh, domestic violence or abuse allegations are false. Okay. How do we deal with that kind of stuff? Even if it's involving Judge Kavanaugh or not, or Keith Ellison in Minnesota, or even me, Say I'm a false allocation. How do you deal with all of these things? They need to pull the politics out because I don't think the Republicans are going to recover for this if they from this if they don't get it right. I think that due to the Me Too movement, and I think women from both sides of the aisle are fed up with their abuse allegations being taken not being taken seriously. Mm-hmm. And I, I don't think that the answer is as soon as I tweet me too um you should just you know i should just name names and there should be no uh investigations and i should um, destroy somebody's um reputation you know you could be sued for libel and slander based on that kind of stuff but i think that um both parties need to focus on investigations and pull the politics out of exactly because you're not Guilty until proven innocent in this country. And Elena Maria Lopez, you are a domestic violence victim, but also talking about September being False Allegation Awareness Month. How can people get hold of you and your great work, Elena? I'll give you the easy New Jersey-sounding website, YoLopez.com. Can you remember that? <laughs> Yo, Lopez. Yo, I mean, Lopez. Is, is there Yo, an exclamation Lo- point Lopez. after Yo, or is it just Yo, <laughs> there Lopez? Should be, but there's not. You could do Elena Maria Lopez.com, but the easy version is Yo, Lopez.com. And you can find out about a lot of the false allegation stuff on Safe Services 
org, and they're able to put down, people don't know that there are certain incentives for making false allegations, such as child custody disputes, divorce disputes, immigration, green cards, you know, fast track green cards, um, monetary damages you can claim. Um, so I think go on to saveservices.org and you can discover some of that. And I think that's what people don't know about. Elena Maria Lopez, YoLopez.com. Find her work there as well, folks. Elena, thank you so much for joining us here on Cowboy Logic Radio. Thanks for having me on. All right, we'll be back with more right after this. Come on, take him on our sunglasses. Come on, take him on. Come on, take him on. Come on, take him on our sunglasses. Come on, take him on our sunglasses. Come on, take him on. Come on, take him on. Come on, take him on our sunglasses. out on the web at cowboylogic.us Hello everyone, I'm Donna Fiducia. And I'm Don Newen. And this is Cowboy Logic Radio. Cowboys didn't dance Didn't wear designer shirts When their hearts were filled with memories their bodies filled with birds They would sit around the campfire Exchange a piercing glance Back when the West was really wild Yeah, didn't think Welcome back to Cowboy Logic Radio. I'm Donna Fiducia, along with Don Newen, who's been very refined this show so far. I have, but I need to let the listeners know very quickly that during the break, when we got Dr. Mitchell on the phone, who's our next guest, I asked him a very simple question that he answered very very eloquently, and that was, as a clinical psychologist, would you consider to me, norm- me to be normal or abnormal? <laughs> and his answer, Dr. Mitchell, in three or four words was... It was, you should be wearing one of those hats that has a flashing red light on it and a t-shirt that says run. <laughs> <laughs> Donna, introduce our stellar good friend and next guest. And I'll tell you, I'm really glad he's our friend. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Clinical psychologist, Dr. James E. Mitchell, whom we had the pleasure of meeting last January at the South Carolina Tea Party Coalition Convention and hanging out with and introducing there. He helped develop the CIA's Enhanced Interrogation Program, <clears throat> waterboarding, and served as interrogator from 2002 until President Obama shut it down in 2009. He co-authored the book, which I have in my hot little hands again, James, called Enhanced Interrogation, Inside the Minds and Motives of the Islamic Terrorists Trying to Destroy America. You served 22 years in the U.S. Air Force, retired as a lieutenant colonel. Your experiences as an interrogator is a law enforcement trained hostage negotiator, served on a hostage negotiating team, and you consulted with military counterterrorist units, the FBI, the NSA, the CIA, on diversion topics. Get a load of this, folks. Surviving hostage situations, selection of individuals for high risk missions, and Handling hostages wired into impro- improvised explosive devices during rescue. In other words, people that are strapped with bombs on them. I can't imagine what it's like to try to talk to those folks. And you've made various TV appearances. We've seen you all over the Fox News Channel and Fox Business lately. James Mitchell, welcome back to Cowboy Logic Radio. I thank you very much for having me on. Did I miss anything? I don't no, think I did. I, I don't think so. But here's, ladies and gentlemen... Uh, Donna and Dr. Mitchell and I and Dr. Mitchell communicate from time to time. And one of the things that was a hot topic this past week was obviously the hearing with, uh, for Judge uh, Kavanaugh, in which Dr. Ford uh, was testifying. Now, Dr. Mitchell, I'd like to devote as much time in this segment as you would like to, first of all, your thoughts on what took place on Thursday how that was all handled, and also tap into your expertise as a clinical psychologist and find out a little bit more. Let's scratch beneath the surface here on what your thoughts are with regard to Dr. Ford, her memories, and possibly what she actually believes that may or may not be reality. Sure. When I was watching um, the, and I did watch her testimony, uh, and his as well, and Kavanaugh's as well, 
uh, it seemed to me that she really believed what she was saying, but it seemed inaccurate. And so I just uh, focused on my clinical experience. And I have to caveat by saying, I'm not saying that what I'm about to say is what actually happened. But I, what I am saying is that if I were investigating this, this is a a highly probable event that I that would make part of my investigation. I would I would clearly address this. So, when you know, uh, my understanding from reading the various articles that came out and looking at her letter and that sort of stuff is that she she uh, the letter is kind of written in a weird, vague way. But basically, these memories really didn't come out uh, until 2012. When she was in marital therapy with her husband, and my understanding is that she went to get that marital therapy because they weren't getting along very well. And in the course of that therapy, she began to believe, or at least report, that it was Kavanaugh, uh, that she had concerns about Kavanaugh. She never mentioned him in her therapy, and she won't turn over all of the therapy notes to the FBI. I would be trying very hard to get those notes, and she should be willing to provide them if she wants her story to be taken seriously. But I, what I think uh, I would explore if I were a person who was doing the investigation is what led her to seek that marital therapy and how the therapist went about approaching what her concerns are. Because there are several different schools of uh, psychotherapy in the United States. And one of them is this notion that when adults have problems, it's almost always because of childhood trauma and Therapy very often focuses first on uncovering that trauma before you begin to work on whatever the issues are that you actually came in to the uh, clinic for. So you could come in for depression and they think that it's related to some child sexual abuse. So you could come in but for marital problems and they'll say your relationship problems are, exist because of some abuse that happened to you as a child. And so you have trouble getting along with people. And the focus becomes on uh, trying to identify those suppressed memories of abuses. And they use a number of techniques that can make people highly suggestible uh, and make them actually believe what they believe. And and there's been a, a, a tremendous amount of research done on these sort of uh, recovered memories, right? Uh, especially with within the context thing. And sometimes they're accurate, sometimes they're inaccurate, and sometimes they're a mixture of accounts that are both accurate and inaccurate. And that's one of the uh, what I think is probably likely here is that she may have suffered some kind of an abuse, but through some sort of either uh, process that she did herself without realizing it or uh, some techniques that were used during therapy. She began to associate his name with Kavanaugh's uh, name with the things that, are ha that had happened to her. Uh, these techniques are are so powerful that they can result in people incorporating well, you know, believing entirely false reports about about incidents. So your listeners may want to go and Google uh, uh, Elizabeth Loftus' uh, TED Talk on this particular thing. She's a per she's a researcher who has spent her entire adult uh, cl clinical career are looking at this issue and has been worked very closely with folks who have been uh, exonerated uh, because of this one person testimony. In fact. The the data on these recovered memories are so clear that a lot of it, uh, uh, it has they have the flaky. You know, some of it can be true, some of it can be not true, and it's hard to know. And, and here's here's what kind of triggered me to think about that is that much of what's alleged in these recalled memories cannot be confirmed or disconfirmed. They're all this vague stuff. You know, think back to what she said. She said. Um, we went into therapy, and over the course of that therapy, she came to understand that it was uh, Kavanaugh who had assaulted her. Well, at that particular time, Romney had mentioned that Kavanaugh may be someone he would appoint to the Supreme Court. And so that gets kind of thrown into the mix in an odd way because his name is in the news, and she may have heard his name, and, she, and she, she clearly knew him as a child. And another point about that was that his mother was the judge that uh, oversaw the case where they lost their home and were forced to Well, they're to be saying that actually might not have been the case with that particular instance. Oh, okay, I'm, really I'm glad so you sure caught that. that. However, what you said uh, before we uh, brought you on the air, I find to be very interesting. You can actually say you're 100% certain, which is what all the news channels are showing. Look, she's 100% certain, yeah, that's but there are ways around it. Yeah, that's a lawyer. That's a lawyer thing. She's been coached by lawyers to say that. I've been in a number of court cases and, you know, always co coached by your lawyers to say that because what you don't want to do is lead 
leave an opening for the opposing lawyer. If you say, well, I think it's him, and they'll go back and say, you think? You think or you know? You know, and then uh, earlier earlier you said you think now you say you know which is it you know they do that kind of browbeating so the lawyers coach you one of the things i was talking about in terms of these uh false memories that are inserted by um uh, th these techniques is that sometimes the preparation for the court case itself actually makes the person more certain than they should be or would have been if that hadn't happened. So you get two sorts of things. One is the misattribution. You, you forget where that source of the knowledge came from. And the other one is something called mistaken identity, where you attach the uh, uh, onerous events in the uh, thing that you're describing to a person who may or may not have actually been uh, involved. And so this is so this is so difficult that the, these reports of past trauma that are based on recovered memories uh, just aren't used to make uh, decisions in, in legal cases uh, if if it is the sole basis for that legal decision. And I think that same standard should be applied to this. You never know, though, with the FBI. I hate to say it. Maybe McCabe and Strzok and Page are going to do the, the questioning. I know. It's just yeah, I, I, I know this, I, the deep state is so deep. I really don't think. Um, that that Donald Trump, anything that he does is going to get a fair shake. But we'll see what ha plays out this week. What I did want you um, to go over also, you said we should look into her therapist, maybe go to her therapist's website, because the therapist could specialize in this type of well, I think highly the suggestible. I, um, yeah, I, sorry to cut you off. I, I, that was what I said to you. What I yeah. what I would say to the listeners is the FBI should interview the therapist. They should get the they should get the therapy notes and they should get the therapist because where everybody is focusing on the content of what they said, I think uh, the uh, part of the investigation should focus on the process of how she recovered these memories, because these uh, false memories that are implanted either inadvertently by yourself, for example, you know, the therapist suggests that uh, maybe there was some uh, sexual trauma in the past and you as a homework assignment decide to flip through the yearbook and you see his face and it looks uh you know, it looks familiar. Uh, and then you, you begin to link those two things with the assault. And the next thing you know, he's the bad guy who did it when it may be someone who looks like him or it may be someone who looks entirely different. You know, there's been uh, laboratory studies where people were interrogated in the Sears schools. This is Elizabeth Loftus who did this, who were interrogated in the Sears schools by people who looked nothing like the person who, after Loftus worked on them and implanted a false memory, they identified. So they identified a bald person who, in fact, when in fact their interrogators had a lot of hair, that sort of stuff. Uh, so these false memories can definitely be implanted. And what I would be interested in if I were doing this investigation and what I would have probably asked her uh, during the actual hearing itself was more about how these memories came to be recovered. Like, you know, what was the what was the first instance in which you had this memory, for example? Uh, and then I want to know what were the circumstances? You know, when did it happen? What were the circumstances? How much of it did you actually recall? You know, uh, what exactly was recalled? How was that? Uh, how was it recollect recollected? And by that, I mean, a lot of these folks who do these, uh, you know, let's let's, all the, let's let's uncover the childhood trauma that's responsible for the misery that you're experiencing in the adult life. They use these suggestive techniques. They could do these guided relaxation things where they try to walk you through what they perceive to be the sexual assault. They can, they can, uh, they do hypnosis. They do uh, something they call, uh, you know, rebirthing or age regression, and they do all of these sorts of techniques that create these false memories. I can give you an example of how how some folks would do that. You know, you say to me, Donna, he raised his voice, right? And I say to you, and you're under hypnosis or you're in one of these relaxed states, I say to you, when he was screaming at you, did he touch you? Now, what I did there was you might focus on did the did he touch you part, but really the false memory becomes he was screaming at me. What you said was he raised his voice, and that can be anything from screaming at you to just saying, hey, you know, uh, and raising your voice a little bit. And these and what we know from the way that our minds work is that we lose track of where that information came from. And all we recall is the actual information itself. And that happens quite a bit. So you get this sort of um, misidentification as the as this memory gets kind of cobbled together. And I should make one other point, which I may not have made in the, the beginning. I don't think I did. And that is that our intuitive sense of how our memory works is wrong. <laughs> it's just wrong. Most of the time, uh, all of us believe that these memories just sort of lie in stasis, uh, dormant, 
uh, until we choose to recall them. But that's not how it works. The environment that we're in, what we're engaged in, our emotional uh, tone at the moment that we do the engagement influences how not only just how that thing is recalled, right, and what emotions and events you think were happening and how those get colored as you recall it. When we put that information again a second time, the things that we are feeling at the time can change the information uh, that's stored in memory. So it's actually something that we would call an emergent process. It's a it's a uh, it's a, a a product of what you actually have stored in memory plus the things that are going on on the outside, what you think, feel, believe uh, at the time that you recall it. And so the danger of these sort of suggestive techniques is that in the second aspect of what I said, they actually change what you what you remember and you really come to believe it. We're talking with Dr. James Mitchell. He's a clinical psychologist. He is um, a person, really, that helped develop the CIA's Enhanced Interrogation Program and served as its interrogator from 2002 until President Obama shut it down in 2009. And that, again, is what he really worked on, is the uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind of 9-11, and you interrogated him, James well, Mitchell, which is amazing. Let's put this in, in very himself. simplistic terms, if, we, if you don't mind. Dr. Mitchell is gifted at getting inside the minds of other people. And that's not something that's very easy to do. Dr. Mitchell, while you were watching the hearings, I'm assuming that not only you watched Dr. Ford's testimony, but that you also also watched Kavanaugh's testimony. Oh, yeah, I watched all of his testimony. I found it riveting. All right. Now, as you probably are aware... One of the new catchphrases that the Democrats are beating like a drum is that he is he does not have the temperament to be a Supreme Court judge. Now, that never came up until after Thursday's testimony that I'm aware of. And the reason that they're saying that is he was pissed off. He was emphatic. Now, as a clinical psychologist, what did you take of, if he his, had been, of his temperament? Well, I've seen a... A surprising number of criminals. And if he was nonchalant about it and just took it in and wasn't angry about it, I would suspect that he actually may have created the abuse. You know, what happens with people who are innocent is they get pissed off. And and what happens with people who are sheer some guilt or at least feel a little bit guilty about it is they try to placate the other person. You know, they try to downplay it. They try not to agitate and raise the stakes or raise the emotionality. So w that would be one of the things that I would be interested in ruling out. I, I found him believable. You know, I think, I think though, in terms of her interview, and again, I'm not saying this is what happened. What I'm saying is this is an area that should be explored. When I talk about this notion about recovered memories, I would be very interested in, I would have liked to have seen the uh, Miss Mitchell who was doing the questioning of no her. No relation. <laughs> no relation to me. Um, uh, I, do, do, you know, spend less time on what she remembered and the smoking and joking kinds of things she was doing and more time on how those memories came about. And if I were the FBI and the president and the people in Congress, I would want to see the rest of those notes because she can't say that they're personal, given that she turned them over to the New York, to the Washington Post or right. turns sections of them over to the Washington Post. So I would be interested in running that to ground. What are some things that um, that uh, Rachel Mitchell asked of the uh, uh, of Dr. Ford that, first of all, you just didn't feel was necessary? I mean, l well, let me back up. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being excellent, how would you rate the job that Rachel Mitchell did? Well, my take of it, having been a guy that's been deposed several times, is she wasn't doing an, a, uh, uh, a challenging questioning of Ms. Ford's story. What she was doing is what we, I would think of as a deposition. Right. So she was asking the questions and, you know, being very cordial and very gentle about how she confronted her with, you know, these uh, different discrepancies in um, her story between what she told uh, the therapist. You know, at the time, she said there were four people involved and then she said, no, no, no. Now there's two people involved. And, oh, there was at least three people there and all of these problems with her memory in terms that's, of that's what really gets me. I mean, these people who she puts in the room uh, to a man and a woman basically said, no, we weren't there. She, you know, is mistaken. And, you know, James Mitchell, you've interrogated terrorists, including Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. 
terrorists, as you've told us in the past interviews, play long ball. I see that happening here in politics. Her handlers played long ball. And I found it very interesting that you said, gee, Kavanaugh actually was kicked around if uh, Mitt Romney became president. And that's around the time. And her, she, her two brothers are lawyers. She's obviously a big time activist, even though she tries to say she's not. She was there the day after Trump was elected and she took part in the women's march. She's uh, she's got handlers, you know, I'll I'll call them lawyers, but they're handlers, really, that are very, very much uh, on the left. In fact, they're socialists and communists, in my opinion. So they're going to sway her. They play long ball. She seems to me like somebody who was a perfect uh, victim, really, to bring forward and uh, would make her story believable just through almost brainwashing for a number of years. You know, like I said, it seems to me uh, improbable that Kavanaugh did this. Uh, it, it seems more likely to me that this is a misattribution or misidentification on one of these recovered memories that either she with her therapist uncovered or she uncovered on her own. Uh, so, so let's assume that that's the case. She may feel perfectly justified in participating in the shenanigans that the Dems are doing in terms of trying to to destroy Kavanaugh's life so that other people will be scared to come forward and apply for jobs that require congressional consent uh, and at the same time derail his appointment to the Supreme Court because they don't want an originalist on the court. The two are not mutually exclusive is what I'm trying to say. Right. So and in fact, if you look at it, it's a it's a. Uh, you know, a she said, they said situation. And it's not a he said, she said situation. She said this happened and everybody she mentioned said, no, that's not what happened. Right. I, you know, that didn't happen. So that would make me concerned. That's one of the other things that makes me concerned about the whether or not this is a false memory, uh, as is this notion that, uh, you know, I've I've dealt in the past with people who who have been sexually assaulted in my clinical practice. And they don't have any trouble recalling it. And in fact, those people who have PSD that I've that I've dealt with, the, it's burned into their mind. I mean, they could tell you absolutely everything about it, uh, and and uh, it hasn't been a problem. So this notion that there's all of these uh, things that people say, well, it's, it's 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 not unusual that she wouldn't remember how she got home. Well, it is a little unusual. And when you combine that with another, you know, with these other things, that's what to me. Uh, instead of saying definitively that these are false memories, it says this is something that should be examined by, uh, you know, by looking at who, where she got the therapy and who's around it and that sort of right. stuff. Right. Hey, we've got about about a minute and a half here left, and I want to throw a question at you that you're not ready for. There was a woman on that committee that damaged your life and put your life and the life of your wife in danger. And that would be one Diane Feinstein. Yeah, she's good at that, isn't she? I would like to get your take, and we only got about a minute on this, of, of your thoughts that she actually suppressed this information from the rest of the, at least the Republicans on the committee. Until, oh, I believe. Until the 12th I believe it hour. Was, I believe it was a calculated thing to do. And in fact, I think the leaking of that letter was a calculated thing to do. The, uh, the, what that she did was she wanted all of those, or the, the Dems wanted, I won't say her specifically, the Dems wanted all of those scandalous charges to be associated with his name so that eventually just hearing his name produced in you the same kind of creepy emotional response that the salacious charges did. And they do it over and over and over and over. And they did the same thing to me and Dr. Jessen, you know, in the, in the, in the press reports afterwards. So, you know, even my wife, who is one of the most level handed person on the planet and, you know, always votes Republican and doesn't believe any of this crap that's going on with Kavanaugh, said to me, you know, just the mention of his name makes me feel a little creepy. And that's because they've been successful at pairing his name with these salacious charges. Right. You say a lie I, enough, they believe it. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have. James Mitchell, you're a clinical psychologist. Find his book, folks, Enhanced Interrogation, Inside the Minds and Motives of the Islamic Terrorists Trying to Destroy America. And what you put in that book that you uh, autographed for us, James, there really are monsters. How true is that? James Mitchell, thank you again for joining us here on Cowboy Logic Radio. Great insight into the mind, uh, psychology mind, of uh, the people that have been in the news lately. Thank you so much. And coming up, Curtis Ellis, former senior policy advisor with the Trump campaign and Trump transition team and now senior policy advisor with America First Policies PAC. It's coming up next on Cowboy Logic Radio. Check us 
out on the web at cowboylogic.us. Welcome back to Cowboy Logic Radio. I'm Donna Fiducia, along with Don Nguyen. And we're going to speak this half hour with our good buddy, Curtis Ellis. Curtis is the former senior policy advisor with the Trump campaign, former chairman of the American Jobs Alliance. That's when we first spoke with you, Curtis. And now you are the senior policy advisor with America First Policies PAC, a a nonprofit promoting pro-jobs and buy American policies. If Curtis's name sounds familiar... Probably because you've seen him on Fox and Fox Business. You've read his stuff on World Net Daily, Real Clear Politics and the Hill, just to name a few. Spoke recently at the Hudson Institute. You've seen his work on 60 Minutes, HBO, NBC, CNN, read more stuff in the New York Times. You get around, Mr. Curtis Ellis. Welcome back to Cowboy Logic Radio. Thank you. And I got eight hours sleep last night, too. <laughs> Did I miss anything? <laughs> No. All right. You you got it all. Explain this to me, this whole your your latest article, how the um, for real clear politics, why Trump's tariffs will not cost consumers a nickel, because that's all you hear. Oh, my God, it's going to be a tit for tat. And and all it is is going to create more, you know, money and it's going to erase the great tax cut that Trump did. So uh, explain there. okay, Lucy. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I got a lot of good feedback on that piece. People said, I really didn't know how tariffs work. So let's try to keep the numbers round here and um, so to make it easy to understand. Let's say there's a 10% tariff on goods coming in from China. That's what the president recently imposed. I think he did a great job doing that, but we'll save that part of the discussion for later. The 10% is not, it's, it's not imposed like a sales tax at the cash register. It's not like you go, like when you go to the store in Atlanta or New York or Los Angeles or Chicago where there's a 10% sales tax where they put it on there. It's not even imposed on the wholesale price that the store paid when they bought something. In fact, the 10% tariff is not even calculated on the basis of what the importer paid, the company paid when the goods came off the truck. Uh, Pardon me, when they came off, let's say, the truck at the Mexican border or the boat coming off the boat from China. Uh, No, the 10 percent is calculated on a far lower price of what the original manufacturer in China, the price that they quoted to some middleman who brokered the whole deal. We'll get into that. I'll explain that in a minute. There's two other things to keep in mind. The list of goods that are being tariffed for the most part, are not finished consumer items, but component parts, right? So let's say there's a 10% tariff on brake shoes, right? So you you import brake shoes from China to put in your car, there's going to be a 10% tariff on the brake shoes. Well, how much of the cost of a car is involved in the brake shoes, right? It's like one one hundredth. So you're going to have 10% on one one hundredth of the cost of the car. If well, there's and, another component. Hey, and yeah, Curtis, let me interject one thing because I love your article for a couple of reasons that I'll explain. But, you know, that tariff is being placed, as you so well describe in this article, on, you know, the guy's cousin that has a factory that's making one of the components on that brake shoe as well. It's not necessarily Correct. even on the entire brake shoe. And yeah, so yeah. that's that's something that's that's fantastic that you've explained in this article. Now, obviously, many of the Democrats in Congress are not going to be discussing this. And quite frankly, it may be because they don't even understand it. You know, one of the things you said in your article is that the forecasters are at a loss to explain while reality isn't conforming with what they learned in school. What a big problem we that's encounter right. every day. 
And, and maybe and, it's because on, Donald it. Trump understands this. And the last thing, Curtis, that I want to give you a serious hat tip for, sir, is thank you for writing an article in which you use one or two sentences in a paragraph. And then you move on to another <laughs> paragraph. Thank you. That's exactly the way I write. And the reason that I write that way is because it's extremely easy for the reader to read. Thank you. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. I, my pleasure. It's, it, it, it helps me read what I write. Otherwise, I wouldn't understand it myself. Exactly. Uh, last big picture piece to remember on the tariffs is, as I said, uh, then we'll get into this, what's called first sale in the jargon yep. of the trade world, uh, because that's very important. It's crucial. I mean, and nobody understands that. I mean, this is something I uncovered in, in a deep dive during the transition period on the presidential transition team. It's like, what can we do to uh, help American business to level the playing field? And somebody started telling me about this first sale business. And I thought, oh my gosh, whoever knew. But before we get to that, let me just say, so the reasons why uh, Americans won't pay a nickel from Trump's tariffs. Is number one, it's not on the finished goods that the tariff is uh, that's being tariffed. It's on component parts. So we're talking about ten percent on a, a fraction of the cost of producing the good. Number two, many, if not well, most, if if not all, of the goods and they did this on purpose that are having the tariff imposed are available from somewhere else than China. The purpose of the tariffs, really, one of the purposes, is to send a message to businesses, do business somewhere else but China. Exactly. Buy, your, buy, buy the ingredients from Americans, buy it from even Mexicans or Germans Vietnam. or Filipinos or Vietnam or Malaysia, and you don't pay a tariff. And that's what's really hurting China. And China's it already has had the effect. Yeah, um, their economy is down. Not a safe it, place. It, it's totally tanked. Yeah. I think it's down what twenty five percent this year. Their economy. Yes, it's it's uh, the economic activity is off twenty five percent. And the same way President Trump has proposed sending some aid to the farmers who are being hurt by the or potentially hurt by the Chinese tariffs on soybeans. Soybeans. The Chinese government is having to give subsidies to a whole bunch of businesses and industries in China that are being hurt by this trade blow up. And they've got a whole lot more businesses that they need to subsidize than we do because they sell a whole lot more to us than we sell to them. So they're really behind the eight ball. They won't admit it, but they are. They won't admit it publicly, but there's a lot of whispering and grumbling going on behind the scenes that they're, they're really in a pickle. Um, now, so let me explain this first sale business, because it's crucial. This is a scandal. It really is a scandal. It shows how the import lobby has taken over our government. And Washington has, until President Trump came along, really been working overtime to drive industries out of America and to drive companies uh, like Walmart and retailers to produce their goods overseas instead of producing them here. So let's just say I use the example in the piece of Black & Decker. Let's say Black & Decker wants to make a toaster oven, and they figure the price point they need to be at to be competitive with the other toaster oven sellers in America is $60. We want to sell our toaster oven for 60 bucks. So Black & Decker goes to a middleman in Hong Kong who deals with all kinds of manufacturers in China, saying, we can give you cheap prices. We'll meet whatever price you want. Tell us what you want. Black & Decker goes to this middleman in Hong Kong and says, okay, I want a toaster oven that we're going to sell for 60 bucks in America. And the Hong Kong middleman uh, calls up his cousin who has a toaster oven factory inside China, and he makes a deal. And his cousin says, okay, I can provide you, I can make those toaster ovens for 10 bucks, And I'll sell them to you, the middleman, for 10 bucks." And the middleman says, Okay, I'll pick them up at your factory. I'll put them on a truck, get them to the uh, get them to the port, load it into the shipping containers, uh, get all the customs clearance forms taken care of, bribe all the officials along the way I need to bribe. And Black and Decker, I can give you that toaster oven for twenty bucks. And Black and Decker says, "Done, sold. Give me ten million toaster ovens at twenty bucks each. We'll pick them up 
off the dock in Long Beach, California. Now, the price, now let's just say there's a 10% tariff on toaster ovens from China. There isn't, but just to understand how this works, 10%, let's say there is, 10% tariff on toaster ovens from China. The 10% is not calculated on the $60, which would be six bucks. The 10% is, uh, the 10% tariff on that $60 toaster oven would come to $1, $1, because it would be calculated on the $10 that the guy in Hong Kong says he paid his cousin in China. That $10 price, the first sale that was made in producing these toaster ovens. So $1 on 60 bucks is on the 60 buck retail price is what that tariff would amount to if there were a tariff. So it's hard to follow numbers on radio. I know this. That's why I wrote it down. You can find it on Real Clear Politics. No, and you but, explained that beautifully, Curtis. Let me ask you this. Is that is that uh, 10% uh, tariff that's placed on the first sale pricing of that, is that often right. uh, a... a uh, a figure that can be negotiated between, say, Black and Decker and that Taiwanese middleman saying, hey, you know what, I don't want that passed on to me, and I don't want to pass it on to the consumer, so you and your cousin figure out a way to eat that because I'm bringing in 10, you know, 10 million units. That's right. Exactly. The guy in Hong Kong wants to make a living. He wants to keep the business from Black and Decker. The guy in China wants to keep the business they may say, well, well, look, we'll eat that. And, and I'm not saying this happens, but I've heard from trade lawyers that it happens very often. Here's something else they do. You tell me how possible it might be for between the middleman in Hong Kong and the guy in China at the factory for them to kind of negotiate what that price is going to be. Well, let's see. You, I know that, hey, you in Hong Kong, you're getting paid 20 bucks from Black & Decker for this. Um, I'll say that you, I'll tell you, and you can tell Black & Decker and U.S. Customs that I'm selling you those toaster ovens, you know, I, the guy at the factory, I'm selling you those toaster ovens for $9. You tell Customs that they cost you, we'll tell everybody they cost you $9, and when you get your 20 bucks from Black & Decker, you can pass me that other buck under the table. There you go. Yep. I guarantee you that happens. You try to follow the paper trail. Almost every time, every time to... Curtis. See, what really gets me <laughs> yeah. is I follow the, the stock market pretty closely now, and prices really have me. Everybody kept saying oh, wholesale prices are going. Amazon is more the problem for uh, Walmart than anybody else, and that obviously... Uh, keeps prices down to some extent for consumers but the to me senators and congressmen need to take an economics 101 course they have no idea i really don't along understand with the constitution this class. exactly along with the constitution class but see donald trump understands this and i think that's what's so crucial that's right. to have a businessman who's been on the other side he's had to deal with china all the time i mean as well as other countries obviously so this is such a major plus, and then you get these idiots in D.C. going, well, why, why does that happen? Well, that's why it happens. He knows from whence he speaks, and in less than two years, he's basically righted this ship at this point, and a rising tide raises all boats. And by the American that's economy right. doing so well, the whole world is doing well. I think the stock market has had $65 trillion in added wealth since he's been president. It's amazing. Right. He understands economics. He also understands the mentality of business. And that is something these people in Washington really don't get. Yeah. It's the mentality of business. The cutthroat, ruthless, get me the results, I don't care how you get it, mentality. And if I have to shave something off you and give you a haircut, I will do it. If I have to take, a, take one for the team right now because I know – uh, in the next round, I'm going to get paid back double. I'll do that too. It's a, it's a very, it's, it's brutal, yeah. and that accounts for President Trump's his personality. What you see, the way he approaches everything, it's uh, cut the crap. 
let's get to the point. <laughs> I love it. And that's I why love we it. love him. That's why we love him. Here in Washington, they're all like process oriented. Well, the process says if you check off these boxes and do this, you will have now conformed to the process. And nobody asks, well, does the process get the results you want? Well, that's not important. It's important that you follow the process. And you, you see this time and again. The congressmen don't get it. And I'll tell you what, I think we've talked about this before, Donna and Don. It, it, I've worked on Capitol Hill. I've worked in the executive branch. I've been around these people. Capitol Hill, these congressmen and senators, they are run by their staff. Mm -hmm. They are so busy trying to raise money and run to the floor to take votes and do this and meet with the lobbyists. Their staff is telling them where to go, what to do, how to do it, what the issues are. And their staff are a bunch of 25-year-olds that have never been out of college, have never worked in the real world. They certainly haven't built a tower on Fifth Avenue. They have no understanding of how the world works. And so they're completely, they believe all this nonsense that, well, the law says it's going to happen. If we, if we decide that we're going to, our, our cars are going to run 100% on flower fumes and rose petals, uh, if we pass a law <laughs> that does. says that, in five years, all of our cars <laughs> will be, <laughs> will, will run on, on, on flower petals. <laughs> It's like, no, it's not that simple, my friend. That right there, Curtis so, Ellis, is a reason to raise the voting age back up to 21. Because until you go to fight for your country at age 18, like we did with Vietnam and we lowered the voting age, these kids today, sound like my mother, don't know anything. Let me just reintroduce you uh, quickly. We are talking with Curtis Ellis. He's worked on a number of campaigns, on federal, state, and local campaigns. He's a former senior policy advisor to the big one, the Trump campaign a Trump transition team member, a former chairman of the American Jobs Alliance, and now a senior policy advisor with the America First Policies Pack. Go ahead, Don has a question. All right, Curtis, I actually have two questions. One is one of those interesting uh, questions that I'm sure all of our listeners would like to, to hear your answer if, if you've been in this particular uh, room. The second question that I'll follow up with you, and I'll get both questions out, and then I'll shut up and let you answer them. But the, the first question is, have you ever been in the Oval Office? And if you have been in the Oval Office, I would like for you to describe to me what that was like, what the aura of that Oval Office was like. The second question, if you haven't been in there, don't worry about answering. Yeah. That, or make something up that I might believe. <laughs> the second question, I want to go back to a, a sentence in your article the forecasters are at a loss to explain why reality isn't conforming to what they learned in school. I want to get you to expand on that as to why something that, you know, you're talking to a guy that went to the University of Tennessee that spent more times playing music and playing sports than he did in his, in his academia classes. But I totally get what you're saying. And it took you about two and a half yeah. minutes to explain it to me. Why are these forecasters not able to wrap their academia heads around this thing. So with those two questions, I'm because going to be they, quiet. Sure. Uh, they can't wrap their heads around it because they've been taught this theory. You can't graduate from, uh, from economic school unless you accept all of the premises of free trade and comparative advantage and David Ricardo and all these theories that were drawn up in 1790 and 1802 before there really was an industrial society and mass production. And when people kept their money in locked boxes and iron safes and uh, things like that. And that quote that I came uh, that I came up with is pulled from a Reuters article where you've got one of the top economists for one of these big Wall Street trading houses saying, well, you know, all of our models and everything says that uh, there should be rampant inflation and prices should be, uh, should be increasing, and I don't understand why that's happening. And he says, it's like there should be a problem, but there isn't. Or we should have something to worry about, but we don't. Uh, and they can't, they're stuck in theoretical land instead of reality of, of looking at things. And if you, and I, was, I went back and I started reading the economic advisor's to Abraham Lincoln, uh, this guy, Henry Carey. And he, it's very interesting because Lincoln is the one who said, give me a tariff and I'll give you a nation. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, and the, he was the first Republican president, uh, first Republican to run for president, if I've got my history right here. And 
It was based on the idea that we need to have industry in this country. And at that time, 1850s, Britain was the workshop of the world. And that's lifted directly from this, this piece that Carey wrote back in the uh, 1850s. Everybody accepted that the English system was the way to do it. And Britain would be the workshop of the world, and we would all supply goods to Britain. We'd send them our cotton, they'd make it into cloth. We'd send them our tobacco, they'd make it into cigarettes. Mm -hmm. We'll send them our iron ore, they'll make it into steel. And Carrie said, no, you should have the factories that turn the cotton into cloth right next to the cotton field. And you should have the steel mill next to the iron mine and the coal mine. Uh, that way you're making more efficient use of the labor. You're not sending it halfway around the world to send it back again to get the finished goods. Exactly. And the exactly. people, after they're, when they're not working in the field, planting the cotton or weeding the cotton or picking the cotton uh, during the winter months, they can be working in the cotton in, in, in the cloth factory. <laughs> so it's a more efficient use of human labor. And the children and the wives and, you know, whatever, uh, you'll see a, a – an increase in the standard of living by doing this right now. And so he argued against the British system. Now at that time, as I said, it was Britain was going to be the workshop of the world today. The accepted wisdom, the conventional wisdom, and they teach this in the schools too, is that China mm -hmm. will be the workshop of the world. And we're supposed to get cheap goods from China. And that's how the world is supposed to work. And this is the way it was. Uh, this is the way it was ordered from, from God himself has decided that this is the way it is. And that's why these, these guys, like that person I quoted in the article, well, you know, we're, we should have a problem, but we don't. But I don't understand why, because this is not what I was taught in school. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You it's know, almost humorous, Curtis. It I really remember is. Made in America when I look at our 67 Ford Fairlane that we have. Yeah. And, the, you know, like oh, Michael Savage yeah. says, when the chrome was thick and, and the, the actual workmanship that went into that car... So, Curtis, real quick, tell us what the Oval Office yeah, is like. Yeah, have you ever been in the Oval Office? I mean, <laughs> I have not. Oh, yeah, I was, I was in it briefly. It's awesome. It's incredible. Um, what does it I was, smell like? Uh, I, mean, I, I mean, I'm being serious when I say that. When you walk into a hotel room, it smells a certain way. It always smells like a hotel room. You know, when you, when, uh, what's, what's that like in that room? It smells like victory. Okay, Damn right it does. <laughs> Damn right it does. All right, uh, real no, quick. I want more, more. You got, well, you got less than a minute, but, I mean, what's it like, man? Is there music <laughs> playing in there? Is it? I mean, what's it like? Uh, it was pretty quiet when I was in there. I mean, I just, uh, I'll, be, I'll be honest, I wasn't in there long. Kind of popped my head in. Um, there are a couple of people sitting around waiting for a meeting with the big guy. He wasn't in there. And, um, you know, I nodded, it's, like I said, it smelled like victory. And I don't mean like napalm in the morning. It doesn't smell like <laughs> napalm in the morning. <laughs> I get it though. It smells like victory, man. Absolutely. It, it like victory, and it's like, it, I was, I kind of a bit like, man, this poor, this, this poor boy from New Jersey standing in the Oval Office. How did that happen? <laughs> yeah, really. And, and thank thing, you for doing that. Thank the, you for the other thing that. is, I know you've been traveling around with Mike Pence as well. You've been down here in Georgia. You got to come back before uh, Election Day yeah. and do some stumping for Brian Kemp. I met his wife um, earlier this week, a lovely lady, Marty Kemp. But uh, we got a little bit of a nail biter because outside organizations, George Soros and. All the environmentalist Linda wacko organizations. is backing Stacey yeah. Abrams. Yeah, exactly. And they've put, like, I think twice the amount of money into Stacey Abrams' campaign than Brian Kemp has. So we got we to gotta oh, try to fight for that one there. That, that, that weasel George Soros, man, yeah. we got we to gotta thwart him. Yep, and Tom Steyer. That weasel. <laughs> and Tom Steyer, now, exactly. Oh, uh, another, uh, another dangerous weasel. Now, I just want to say on a humorous note here that I think uh, you, we may have heard there's something going on with the Supreme Court in the Senate that Judiciary Committee. Oh, no, I wasn't now, aware of that. I think if we go back, I've got the solution going forward. <laughs> okay. That, or now going forward, they've got, I have, uh, they're going to do an FBI investigation. I, and I want the FBI to do its investigation. But you've got to take into account ancient Jewish law, right? The Jewish law, uh, Moses lays down in Deuteronomy very specific rules for who can be a witness and how you can bring charges. And then all the rabbis over the centuries uh, you know, uh, developed this. And the Sanhedrin and the Talmud 
and uh, who's capable of being a witness. And uh, the, um, the Mishnah, uh, Sanhedrin, says the following people are disqualified from being witnesses. Uh, and one of, one of the disqualifications is a chaser of doves. So when the FBI investigates, whether it's Mark Judge or whoever, let's make sure that this person is not a chaser of doves. So Absolutely. Leave it at that. It, that will settle this once and for all. If we can establish. I think we ought to follow that, the money trail and see I who's think funding. I we only ought to nominate Unix <laughs> from this point forth. I mean, if you had a beer uh, in high they're school, they're you're identifiable out. identifiable as any gender. They're simply Unix. <laughs> And and we have no problems. There. Exactly, Donna. We well, gotta Don, go. We gotta go home here. There. I, yeah, I think so. All right. On that note, we'll Curtis Ellis, thank think, you so I think much. That's the purpose of this whole thing. Exactly, Curtis Ellis, former senior policy advisor with the Trump campaign, chairman uh, or former chairman of the American Jobs Alliance. You were in the Trump transition team. You've worked on a ton of campaigns. Now with a uh, senior policy advisor with the America First Policies PAC. We thank you so much for joining us again. Always fun to talk to you on Cowboy Logic Radio. Thank you. All right, and that wraps up another show, folks. Find us again at CowboyLogic.us. We'll see you next week, same bat time, same bat channel. And in the meantime, God bless America. Cowboy Logic.